Okay, so um, this is the last lecture I'm proposing to give for this course. Okay, so there is in the um, course structure on mold, it does actually say one more revision lecture, um, but I'm hoping we can do a review of a past exam paper in this lecture, and then uh, the tutorial sessions will keep going right up to week 12. Okay, so if you need extra input from myself or from, uh, we have some helpers on the tutorial sessions, then please come along to them. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick summary of the course, what we've covered, and then we're going to do a, a review of a past paper. We're going to go through last year's exam paper. Well, we'll start going through it, we'll see how far we get. So, summary of what we did. We did, uh, started with what you might call mechanical vibrations. Okay, so this is the sort of classic theory of um, vibrations of a single degree of freedom system. And we included things like harmonic motion. And sine waves, didn't we? Basically, we said that everything was a sine wave. <clears throat> we did free vibration. where the system is just released from an initial condition and then allowed to oscillate. And so, of course, it decays away because there's no energy being added into it. And so we did the log decrement, didn't we, as well? Which was a method for estimating from that decay uh, what the critical, uh, what the uh, relevant damping parameters were. So we did after that, we did forced vibration. So this is when we're, we're shaking it with some external force. And we can either shake it directly, or remember, we also had the case of a rotating out of balance mass, didn't we? And we did two types of, sort of the, um, analysis. We ended up with the dynamic magnification factor. which is also called a uh, dynamic amplification factor. Either amplification or magnification, is either is fine. And we also did transmissibility, didn't we? So that's transmissibility is, is when you're shaking the support that the the oscillator is um, attached to, okay? So if we're, if we're applying the force to the oscillator itself, we get the dynamic magnification. If we're applying the shaking by moving the support, then we get transmissibility. So we then did um, some system models. Um, particularly, we looked at um, things like equivalent stiffness. So we used our um, energy functions to draw an equivalence between a certain system and then uh, a simplified version of the system. We talked about damping and how it of, which means how energy is lost from the system. And we had different cases. We had viscous damping. We had friction damping. And we had things like hysteretic damping as well. So that was all in the sort of first half of the course. Second half of the course was um, about rigid body dynamics. And there we started with kinematics. And we talked about uh, translating and rotating frames.
and we did everything in terms of vector algebra. We did kinetics and particularly looked at angular momentum. We did uh, balancing of rotors. And last lecture, we talked about the tabular method for doing that. And then lastly, we did gyroscopes. And of course, we talked about things like precession and the gyroscopic moment, didn't we? So, that's a summary of, um, of what we did in the course, just briefly going through the, you know, hi highlighting the main topics. So, so the exam format that we have, and I'm going to, we're going to have a look at the exam paper in a minute from last year. So it has, uh, so from 2015, it has this format. Okay, so y you should be able to, I think there are some papers that go back past that, okay, but from 2015, it's been formatted as two parts, part A and part B. So in part A, there's three questions, and you have to answer all of them. And part B, you answer one out of two, so you've got a choice in part B. I think... Uh, Part A has 50 marks, in a total potential marks of 50, I think, is that right? Yeah, and then part B, you get, uh, each question is worth 25. So the total marks of the paper are 75. And of course that's then scaled into a percentage. So on the on mole, what you'll find is that you can uh, all papers from 2015. You can revise all the questions. Okay, so so from that date, they're they're all relevant. You'll find as well, if you, look at, if you look on MOLE at the past papers, there's a little introduction and it tells you for, for exams before that, it tells you which questions in those exam papers are relevant if you want to do extra revision by going back through some older exam papers. Okay, so there's, so there's a selection of questions that are available to you from the older papers. So have a quick look at the format. So this is the format of, uh, sorry, let's have a quick look at the actual paper. So if I just zoom out slightly. This is the paper from last year. Okay, so that just repeats the information. Um, lots of people have asked about the, the uh, formula sheet. So let's just, let's look at that first. Okay, so this is the formula sheet Hopefully most of you have found this now. Okay, so, and in a minute when we go through the questions, you'll see 
where some of this is um, used. So there's some information about things like uh, how you get stiffnesses from different types of beams or springs. And then the next part of the formula sheet is some information about second moments of area. And then some. this bottom part is all about the um, mechanical vibrations stuff. So this, this, these things here are all from mechanical vibrations. OK, so let's just look at what the types of questions are that came up last year. And obviously, you can go through looking at all of the past papers and all of the solutions to get a feel for the, the types of uh, questions. So this is question one. And I think if you look back in the last few years, you'll see that this, you know, that ha there's a style to this type of question usually. It's usually focused on uh, mechanical vibrations. Um, and you can see there's a picture, figure question one, down here, which is a mass spring damper, okay? So what it says is an aerospace system modeled using a single degree of freedom oscillator, um, which is shown in this figure. Um, and it gives you some physical parameters, so some actual numerical values. Okay. And it tells you that there's a forcing function applied. It tells you what the, um, what the magnitude of the, uh, the forcing is and so on. Okay. So the first part of the question asks you to derive the equation of motion for this system. Okay. Um, so, let's have a quick look at that. So, first, derive equation of motion. It's, it, you can tell quite a lot by looking at the marks distribution as well, okay? So, relatively small amount of marks for A and B, and then quite a lot of marks for this part. Actually, it says D, but this is a typo. It should be C. So, you can tell that within this question, there'll be a lot more work in this, this third part than these first two bits, OK? And the structure of these exam questions, are, I've, I've already said to some of you in conversations in tutorials and so on, is the general structure of questions, at least in this exam, is you know, everybody should be able to do this first part A. You know, nearly everybody should be able to do part B. But by the time you get to part C, it's going to feel much harder, OK? And that's kind of you know, a, a purposeful way of designing exam questions. So we differentiate out, like, you know, the cohort's ability, if you like. People who can get right through and answer every single thing in a question, there'll be a very small percentage of those people in the overall, mark, you know, when we do the marking, okay? So it should feel like, okay, I've done that, that's reasonable, but now I'm, this is getting tough in these later parts of the questions, okay? There's a bit of that also in the overall exam. So in, in parts A and parts B, generally part A should be a little bit more achievable overall. The questions in part B are slightly harder and slightly longer. Okay? But again, they still have this structure so that everybody should be able to do some of the initial parts of the question. So in the solutions online, let's have a quick look at the solutions for this. So it says derive uh, the equations of motion. So if you just write it down, you'll get some marks. OK, so this is the equation of motion that we're looking for, this one that we went and wrote down a lot in the lectures in the early part, mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx equals f. OK, so you'll get some marks if you write it down. But if you draw the free body diagram and have some explanation of how you've derived this equation, then you'll get all of the marks. OK, so that's the kind of... That's the kind of thing. So if you look at the terminology, if this said write down the governing equation of motion, then you'd get all the marks for writing it down. But if it says derive the governing equation of motion, it means you actually have to show some methodology by which you've arrived at that equation. Okay? So, and that's explained here in my, in my scrawling on the right-hand side. So critical damping ratio. So this is really about plugging in numbers and, and remembering some of the expressions about the uh, single degree of freedom oscillator. So the critical damping ratio is given by this formula, and we can plug in the numbers to get a value. And again, typically what you're, 
in the marking scheme, obviously we're looking for a value and units to be given as well, okay? Um, so, we, this is, gives us C critical. We're given C, the actual value of C is in the question. So to get the damping ratio, we divide one by the other, which gives us this value here, okay? And what, we're, what you're supposed to notice is that because zeta is less than one, the system is underdamped, okay? And you get a mark for that. It actually asks that in part B of the question. So if we just go back to the question. So part B says work out what the value is and then determine whether the system is underdamped, overdamped, or critically damped, okay? And as you know from what we did in the lectures and in the tutorial sheets, we're nearly always dealing with underdamped systems because they're the ones that have oscillations, okay? So, so it would be surprising if it wasn't underdamped, but you know, you never know what's coming up. So you're asked to explicitly state, you know, it's underdamped. Okay, so now we move on to part C. So remember what I said that, you know, this will feel harder. 11 marks out of the total is, is for this part. Okay, so there's, there's quite a lot more work in this, actually working out what's going on. And this part relates to the forced vibration of the system. So in the question, what it says is, it says the oscillator is forced with a frequency omega 62.2 radians per second. Find the maximum steady state displacement of the system and sketch a graph of x of t against time for one full oscillation of the system with initial conditions set to x is 0 0.02 meters and x dot is zero, okay? So there's kind of a lot to digest in that, but it's really applying, you know, forced vibration analysis that we did in the, in the class. So you have to work out a few things. You have to work out what the undamped natural frequency is. You have to work out from then the damped natural frequency Okay, um, you then get a frequency ratio of the value you're given. You're given 62.2 in the question related to the natural frequency that you've worked out, the damped natural frequency, you've, you've just worked that out. That gives you your R value. Okay, so that's your frequency ratio. And then you use this equation for the dynamic magnification factor. Okay, you've, give, you, you've got F. So you've got everything here now. You've got F and K from the question. Okay, you've worked out what R is, you've worked out what zeta is, so you can plug all your numbers into this, okay, and get, um, get some value out, okay? And that's what you work out here. Okay, so you work out that it's this meters, in this in terms of millimeters. Okay, so, so now you've got to work out um, the, uh, the last part, okay? So you've been given some initial conditions, so you're... Um, you know that your, your system is a, is a simple cosine wave because your initial velocity is zero. Okay, you can work out the phase from the ex phase expression. And then you can draw a sketch. Okay, so I've messed around with this because um, I've drawn it a couple of times. You actually only need to draw this curve here, this black line. Okay, so I've also drawn on the, some other lines, which is one of which is the forcing Okay, but you don't, you, it, the question doesn't actually ask you for that. Okay, it just asks you to draw this black line here. Okay, so what you're basically you're doing is you're sketching a um, cosine wave which has been slightly shifted. Okay, so it's, it's shifted by a phase. Okay, it starts at 0 0.2. So again, I've drawn this pretty badly, to be honest. But it's, it's trying to show that this, this is where it starts, which is 0 0.2. And it gets, a maximum, it gets to a maximum of, of, of 0.26. Okay, which is what we worked out from the steady state um, dynamic magnification factor. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea of, of that question. Um, and and that's, that last part is quite tough, but kind of doable. So question two, and again, if you look at the if you look at the pattern in the last few years, question two tends to have this kind of style. It tends to give you some pictures and diagrams to look at, okay? And it tends to ask you questions based on the pictures and the diagrams. So what does it say here? Question two, it says, data shown in the figures was recorded from some vibration tests with different damping levels, okay? And then it asks you, 
what are these what are these things these symbols okay and uh, you've got to kind of say what they are then it says what's the dynamic magnification factor when the damping zeta is equal to this value what's the phase at resonance okay and you're given relatively you know these are sort of smallish questions with small numbers of marks for that that part of the question and then the second one here again it shows you some pictures and it asks you to work out what or state what the type of damping is okay and then finally part C write down some sources of vibration that commonly occur in aerospace structures so everybody should be able to do that they, these are dead easy marks aren't they right okay so you can write those write down some answers to that okay so in the solutions okay so x over xs is the um, ratio of dam dynamic to static displacement often called the dynamic magnification factor which we just had in the last question r equals uh, w omega over omega n is that that's the frequency ratio and this phi symbol is the phase okay so that should be all pretty straightforward so when when zeta is 0 0.0625 what's the dynamic magnification factor well if you of course the curve is the dynamic magnification factor but what engineers are most interested in is what's the peak value okay so it's a short when people say what's the dynamic magnification factor they mean how big could the oscillation get or be magnified okay so the answer is it's eight okay because you know, we don't really care if it's magnified the input is magnified by one we don't really care but we do we do really care if it's eight times bigger than the input okay so and what's the phase at resonance well of course resonance here's the phase diagram resonance occurs at, at um, one when r is one and here it's equal to pi over two so this these values here are in radians unless it states otherwise phase is always in radians if it said degrees then obviously sometimes you get degrees then this would be 0 90 and 180 um, so this is pi over 2 or if you give a numerical value of 1.5 whatever that's fine as well so next one it says about these plots so what's the plots well what you're supposed to notice from this diagram is that this decay is is almost like straight lines here okay and this decay is like a, an exponential decaying envelope okay so the straight line decay is friction damping and the exponential decay is um, viscous damping so that's what the that's what the question is looking for so and then it asks you so again it, here you get a little bit of you know you get two marks for each so if you just wrote it down you'd get one mark if you explain why you've got it you know from the exponential decay curve uh, sorry from the line, from the shape of the decay curve then you get that extra mark and then these are typical answers to part C okay so people write down things like this um, which are all acceptable and there's other there's other things that you can come up with for sources of vibration so um, that's question two so they're basically both of those questions are basically mechanical vibrations aren't they question three is uh, typically a rigid body dynamics question okay and so that's what you've got in in this from last year and it tells you that there's some mechanism that you've got to analyze it says it's from a helicopter but it's it's arbitrary it doesn't really matter it's some kind of system it's giving you the ij and k out of the page so you already know that this is the this is the type of format of the thing you've got to use um, and it tells you that you know this this rod here has collars a and b and this can it can slide in some sense um, along these rails and it asks you to find angular velocity of the rod when the angle here is at a certain point what's the velocity so these are sort of 10 marks and then the last part asks you to find the acceleration 
again when it gives you some some data okay so this is going to be one of those questions so again looking at the solution it's quite important to try and do, draw an accurate diagram and do the trigonometry first because that's that's obviously plays a big part in getting these things right so if there's obvious angles and things on the diagram then you can you can work that kind of stuff out can't you it helps also you know to write down your coordinate system and if if you want to just give yourself a reminder of these kind of relationships you write those down but basically we go through the types of thing that we've done in the last uh, part of the course so working out the velocity at one point based on the velocities at the other points and then this vector component is re replaced with a rotation multiplied by a distance okay and I've actually updated I noticed that I'd written these the wrong way round okay com compared to how they should be for the convention so I've actually just today I've updated the um, uh, the PDF okay so these are, these are actually the right way round now so this is then sort of turning the handle um, you know the distance vector is related to the trigonometry so you can put all that into an expression and multiply it out to get your components in terms of i and j you're given the velocity at a so you can write that down again the velocity at b you can write down as a angle times a distance so you can multiply all that out and most of these questions are coming down to you know getting to a point where you can equate terms in i and j so that the format of these questions the solution to that is you know draw the picture write down the governing equation for velocity or acceleration plug everything in and then equate terms in i and j because they have to equate and then you'd pretty much always find that they're a set of simultaneous equations okay and so you can solve these as a pair of simultaneous equations which allows you to to get something out in this case we were asked to find the angular velocity omega a b and so that's what we end up with as our final kind of solution to part a of this question part b asks you to work out what the angular velocity of vb is and now you've worked this out you can plug that in and you can leave it in these terms just in terms of um, an i component and a j component all right so that defines a vector so the um format for part C is exactly the same, but of course, because it's the acceleration expressions, it's a little bit more algebraically uh, intense. So you're asked to find acceleration, so you write down your acceleration equations. You know some of this stuff already, right, from the previous part of the question, and you're given this acceleration from the question as well. So as I said, it's just a case of trying to plug everything in equate terms in i and j and then solve simultaneously so that's what you're doing down here and then you can come out with the um, uh, angular acceleration as your as your final answer okay so the you know in exams these these kind of things are hard to get right because it's easy to make a small mistake isn't it okay but if you just try and follow the basic format write the equations plug it all in equate i and j solve simultaneously so that's that's section a in the in the exam and the, the pattern in the marking that i see is that most people do very well on question two normally the kind of looking at the pictures one question a people do pretty well on and the question sorry question one people do pretty well on and but question three you know because of that I think a lot of people find the rigid body stuff harder lots of people don't do so well on that the ones that tackle it and know their stuff do just as well as the other questions but I think in terms of revision what I noticed students sometimes think well I'll really focus on the first half of the course maybe I won't revise some of the rigid body stuff because I find it harder and you see that as a pattern in the in the um, in the marking so then so that's part a so part B you've got a choice now of two of these questions uh, you've got two questions you've got to choose one or the other so obviously you need to have a read through and work out which one you reckon you're going to get the most marks on okay I try and make them relatively even 
But again, what you see in the marking is that some, like, some years, almost everybody chooses one of the two, so that I obviously have done something in the other one that they don't like. Um, and some years it's a bit more even, so some, some years it's a bit more of an even split. Um, and that's, that's usually what I'm trying to uh, aim for, that they're both sort of roughly as hard as each other. So this one, you know, it's typical as well to give a bit more preamble. So this one talks about, you know, that there's a test specimen testing in a lab. Here's a picture of it down the bottom. Okay, so probably something that you haven't seen before. Okay, some kind of, you know, system that you're, that you're being introduced to in the question. And um, it gives you a whole bunch of parameters. You know, it, now this time it's telling you that it's a beam. Okay, so it's giving you some beam properties. So that should immediately make you think, well, I'm probably going to have to go to the formula sheet and use the equations for beams from the formula sheet. And probably, you know, it's giving you dimensions and so on. Um, what is it giving you? So, again, you might have to use the, the equations for second moment of area or, or those types of things as well, okay? So the first bit is to calculate equivalent stiffness of the beam um, so that you can model it as a single degree of freedom system. Uh, then it, this bit here is, is a thing that can come up. It's basically asking you to, you'll get marks for deriving this equation, basically. So it's saying that ignoring the mass on the beam, assuming damping is from a viscous damper, shows steady state vertical displacement of the specimen is given by this. Okay, so this is like a trans, this is the transmissibility equation, isn't it? Okay, so it's asking you to do a simple, the simplest version of the derivation of that. Okay. And then, again, same, same kind of style as the other ones. As we go to the later parts of the question, things are going to get a bit tougher. Okay, so this bit here is asking you to consider what happens when uh, part of a test actuator is switched off and then we gather free vibration data. Okay, so you've got to then um, calculate a few things from that. And then lastly, it asks you to calculate the frequency um, when x equals y. Okay, so that's actually um, slightly harder than it looks. Okay, and again, so you're getting some marks for that. So let's have a look at the solution. <coughs> Excuse me. So as I said, to start off with, it's asking you to find the stiffness. Okay, so you go to the formula sheet. It tells you for a cantilever beam that the equivalent stiffness is this, and you've got all of these, these values given to you in the question, so you can plug those in. Okay, but first, before you do that, you have to work out what I is, the second moment of area. Okay, so we need 3 EI over L cubed. Again, that comes from the formula sheet, and you're given the, you're given the quantities you need. Okay, so in this, time, if it, in this case, it's a circular beam. You're given the radius. Okay, you can plug that in to get a value for second moment of area, uh, and look, I've been bad there and left the units off, haven't I? That's really bad. I'm going to lose my mark. Um, so, now, so when you've got second moment of area, so you can plug it into the K expression and you can get um, some equivalent stiffness. So, you know, even though this is question in part B, these, this should be easy marks, right, because this is basically finding two formulas on the formula sheet and plugging in numbers and you, you know that shouldn't be difficult but you've got to kind of you've got to recognize what what it's asking you to do and then if the stuff's on the formula sheet it should be straightforward second part is not that straightforward in the same sense because this is asking you to derive something okay so it's saying can you derive that expression for transmissibility so that's obviously a bit tougher right especially if you if you're not keen on deriving the equations but if you remember, the transmissibility expression is for when the support input is given. Okay, so the forcing is coming from moving the base in this case. All right, so you can do a free body diagram and write down these initial equations. Okay, and it's the kind of format that we did all over and over again in the first half. You make an assumed solutions that these are sine waves in the forms of exponentials. Plug those in. The exponential time dependent bit divides out. So you end up with an x over y. Okay, and then the last little bit is if you divide it, each, all the terms by k. So if you divide top and bottom by k, basically, you can prove that this 
thing is what's given in the question, which is this bit here. Okay? So that's kind of a, that's kind of a bit of like bookwork derivation. Then in um, part C, what you're asked to do is, is a free vibration um, sub-question. Okay, so you're, it gives you some data, and then you're asked to work out um, what the, or estimate what the, um, uh, the damping zeta is. And so again, you have to plug in the numbers to that. This bit of the question here is something that, that you, you won't have seen before, necessarily. All right, so you've seen it now, but for people who were doing this last year, they won't necessarily have, have seen it. So this is the type of, so getting to the end of the paper, harder part of the question. So here I'm looking to see who can, who can solve a problem that they necessarily haven't trained themselves for. Because it's asking you, what's the effective weight of the beam? So if you've got a cantilever beam, you clamp one end into, the, into a support and the other end is moving. Not all of the cantilever beam mass is participating in the vibration. Okay, so it's something that's commonly done to take a sort of effective amount of that mass and include that in the vibration. So that said, it should be, it should be something that's you know, doable in an exam. So the way you do it is you work out your natural frequency, so you're given some data on that. Then you can rearrange this natural frequency equation to get an estimate for the mass. Okay, so this is the actual, this is the mass that's partic participating in the vibration. You know how much the specimen weighs, okay? So you can subtract one from the other to give you, you know, the effective bit of the beam that's taking part in the vibration. That's what it's asking you to find. Okay? So, and then it asks you to do that as a ratio. So you can work out using the volume of the beam and the density gives you its actual mass. So you've got the ratio of the part of the beam that's participating in the vibration compared to its, its dead weight, if you like, or its, its complete mass. And so again, the reason, so if you're, if you're on the ball, you'll have recognized that for a cantilever, you know, the bit that's clamped in the end is not participating, but the bit at the other end is. So this is, this is you get a mark for noting that as well. So again, we get to the, like, this is the last part of, the, of, a, of, the la, of, of a question at the end. So this is deliberately set to be quite difficult. So you kind of really have to know this from the notes. And so if you go back to the notes for transmissibility, there was a little tiny bit where we showed that when x equals y, then this is equal to 1. This, this thing here is equal to 1. So you can square both sides. You can multiply through and find this relationship. And if you do that, you can work out that either r is 0 or r is root 2. Okay. And so omega over omega n is r. So we have, we have this, this relationship is equal to root 2. We know what omega n is because we've got the data for that so you can plug that in and get a final value okay so this is supposed this is deliberately quite tricky and as I say when you're marking it only a few people will get right through these kind of longer questions and kind of come out with with all of these um, everything right so last question on uh, last year's paper So this one was um, basically encapsulated what we did last lecture. So it shows you a picture of, of an aeroplane. Okay, and uh, the question gives you some data that the, uh, it's a single prop plane with a uh, rotational speed um, given there and uh, gives you some data about the moment of inertia of the propeller and the rotating shaft. Okay, so then part A is a gyroscope question. Okay, so it says it's traveling at 400 kilometers an hour, turns left on a radius of 500 meters around J axis, and it actually gives you the I, J, and K axis in the picture down here, look. Okay, so it's giving you the, giving you the I, J, and K. Um, and you're asked to find out, you know, how the gyroscopic moment affects the airplane and does the tail rise or fall. Okay, so quite... Uh, in some ways tricky, but also um, it's just if you know the gyroscope equations, it's a straightforward application of that. Part B is what we did on balancing. So this is a tabular balancing-ish um, question. And what it tells you is that the propeller 
and shaft and engine have some unbalanced masses in them. Okay, so they're like a rotating shaft. So the prop shaft goes right through into the engine. And this table is partially completed, and it tells you some of the information you, you need to know about this system. Okay, and then it tells you to take moments about plane B, which is this one here, where one of the bearings is, complete the table so that you get static and dynamic balance. And then it tells you to show the working in the answer book and so on. And then the final part, the question is, again, what we did in the example last time, is tells you to find out the forces acting on the um, bearings in the system due to the unbalanced masses. Okay, so this is all about either gyroscopes or balancing this question. So if you don't like those things, then you wouldn't choose this one, I guess. So, solution. So to start with, we have to take some of the information from the question and, and work out some key uh, components. So we have to work out what the speed of the aircraft is. We have to basically convert these things into appropriate units for us. Okay, so the first one is 400 kilometers an hour is 111.1 um, meters per second. We write down the gyroscopic equation. Okay, we note that this is what's given in the question. Okay. We need to work out what the um, omega value is, okay? And we do that from uh, V over R, so the, uh, the arc length approximation to give us um, a value times J. We've got the speed of the engine given to us, the RPM. So again, we convert that to a, <coughs> a radians per second times K, okay? And then we can plug that into the equation for our gyroscopic moment. We get the moment value, okay? And then if you've done the questions in the, in the uh, tutorial sheet, you'll know that the, the thing that's a bit non-intuitive is that if the moment's acting this way, the reaction is in the opposite direction, okay? So you have to think about if the moment's acting in positive direction, the reaction's the other way. And so you have to work out whether the nose goes up or down or the tail goes up and down, okay? So you can give a, a solution to, to that. And then the, the next two parts are very similar to the, the uh, example we went through last time. So this is my table for the bearing uh, uh, balancing problem. Okay, so what I did was I, first of all, I wrote down what I was given in the, in the exam question and then these ones in red boxes are what I've worked out from doing the working below okay so the working below follows exactly the same pattern as we did in our previous example okay so you first you work out these ones the MRD ones okay so you go through and work those ones out first and again this is just a case of cranking cranking out these equations and being very careful when you're working out the arctan as I said to you last time okay you need to think about that and um, then you go through and do the sum of MR. So again, you go through all of these sine and cos relationships and carefully work out the arctan, work out what the MR value is, and that you put those back in here. Okay, so then you can work out all of the data for these missing entries. Okay, just one thing to note is it doesn't give, it, in the question, it tells you that all of these things are, are 0.2 meters apart, and it tells you to take moments about point B. Okay, so this one is minus 0.2. Okay, so that's, so you, do you see what I mean? B is not at the end. So this, this is the propeller, this is the bearing. These are two unbalanced planes, and then this is another bearing. Okay, so when you're doing distances, these aren't filled in for you, but you can start at zero, and you can go positive one way, and you can go negative the other way. Okay, so that's just a, a minor detail to note. So you fill in the table, and then the last part is the bearing loads. Again, this is exactly what we, we were looking at in that example in the last lecture. The magnitude is mR omega squared, and you give an omega squared in, sorry, give an omega in the question in part A. You're given the mR values of what you've worked out in the tables, so you can plug those in and come out with solutions for loads on the bearings at angles. Okay, so 
that's quite a, a rapid run through the solutions, but what you see is that um, those questions in the second part can encompass a combination of mechanical vibrations plus rigid body dynamics as well, can't you? Whereas in part A, they tend to be either mechanical vibrations or rigid body dynamics. So in those questions in the second part, it can become more complicated. Has anyone got any questions? Stunned, in, you're, either, you're either terrified now, aren't you? Or you're thinking it's gonna be easy. And I can't tell quite, I think maybe terrified slightly, mildly terrified. It's all right, don't worry about it. Anyway, um, see you on Friday at the tutorial if you're coming along. <laughs>